for attending our talk this afternoon and um, I'd like to highlight that we do have other co um, contributors but unfortunately they weren't able to make it today. So um, this paper presents the intended aims of the project and how this was achieved and the visualization work we've done including creating interactive maps of the results. Oh, so it doesn't So the overall aim of the project is to use the data set produced by text mining about 5,500 Medical Office of Health reports covering the Greater London area spanning from 1848 to 1972 as a tool to explore and interpret the lives and health of 19th and 20th century Londoners. <laughs> this is a collaborative interdisciplinary project and our aim is to enhance and demonstrate the capabilities of innovative text mining tools we designed to allow the automatic extraction of information from OCR text. Furthermore, as the data becomes more structured, they can be readily overlaid with other information such as maps and images. Having multiple layers will enable us to run various comparisons and assess if there are any correlations between smells and diseases, as well as links to the socio-economic identity of areas of London. The text mining tools and any derived resources are made available to the wider community via GitHub and the project website. We have been working on this project for just over a year, part-time, and still have some more work to do. Okay. So I'm going to go through what we've done during our first phase in 2016. So we successfully data mined over 5,500 MOH reports and created the data set of smell-related words and produced a simple map. And so far this year, we um, categorized the smells in the data set and created the new map, which I'm going to show you later on. And we are currently working on extracting implied smells, and we will be producing a report on how smells are linked to health and the socioeconomic identity of London boroughs. So I'm going to tell you a um, little bit more about the MOH report. So each local authority was required to appoint MOH who oversaw the work of a team of assistant medical officers, sanitary inspectors, health visitors and clerks as they carried out the work necessary to met, meet their public health responsibilities. So that happened during the 19th century. So MOH reports are annual reports that hold on issues such as mortality rates, disease outbreaks, sanitation, port hygiene, school health and food inspection including lots of issues around ice creams. I don't know whether you guys are aware of um, health issues around <coughs> ice creams in the 19th century. And they've been long regarded as an important source for 19th and 20th century history of public health and stem from a reaction to infectious disease in mid 19th century. So you might wonder why just London? So I work for Wellcome Trust and then we digitized about, um, you know, as I explained, the 5,500 London reports a few years ago and made them available online in the resource called London's Pulse. We've just started digitizing approximately 70,000 reports covering the rest of the UK and Ireland. So they will become available through the Internet Archive and welcome. Therefore, we thought it would be a great opportunity to run a pilot project using these London reports. And there are other reasons for data mining the reports. So close reading of these reports can be extremely challenging. First of all, as I explained earlier, there are over 5,500 individual reports. And some reports contain about 150 pages or more, so they present a daunting amount of reading. Secondly, overall, these reports are very dry and um, full of very detailed facts and statistical data. So it's not a riveting reading experience. And lastly, Although these reports were not standardised and authors were able to express the diversity of their local communities and their own personal interests, the majority of the reports are similar in many respects in terms of their main contents. Therefore, they are largely repetitious when read in large quantities. So we concluded that we would benefit from using text mining tools to extract useful knowledge and to discover interesting patterns with less human effort. So now I'm going to move on to why um, I became interested in smells. So smells are part of how we understand the world around us. 
Roy Porter, the popular and well-regarded medical historian, claimed that today's history comes deodorized. Although we often know what the past looked like, we don't get a chance to hear, feel, or smell the past. Medical historians have incorporated some aspects of sensory history into their research and explore the past belief that bad smells were causes, causes of disease. However, there's very little research carried out covering this period. Furthermore, the, despite the rise of germ theory in the 1880s, concerns with the disease causing miasma, meaning smells, did not disappear entirely. So during the 19th century, the paranoia surrounding smells associated with the poor hygiene heightened in many European cities. Um, I think the Great Stink of 1858 is a great example. Um, are you familiar with the Great Stink of 1858? Anyone? <laughs> okay. I thought um, everyone in the UK knew about this. <laughs> so the image you can see here is a cartoon from Punch magazine, and it was June 1855, showing how smelly the River Thames was. So it was the overwhelming stench from the River Thames in the summer of 1858, London came to a standstill and the possibility of moving Parliament to either Oxford or St Albans was seriously considered to get away from the River Thames. So in my view, the smells contribute to the construction of places' socio-economic identity. For example, the greasy smells coming from fast food restaurants are often associated with rundown areas. About a year ago, I found this article published in The Guardian, in which <coughs> was the phrase, the chicken chomp mile. In Tower Hamlets, one in eight children starting primary school are obese, and that doubles to more than one in four when they leave at age 11. The borough has the fifth highest rate of child obesity in London, and the sixth in the country. Health professionals believe that the 42 chicken shops for secondary school in the borough are one of the reasons. I live in Tower Hamlets and I can smell fried chicken. And on the way here this morning, we smelled them fried chicken. So, um, and then also, according to London's poverty profile, almost half of children in Tower Hamlets live in poverty. And um, so that's the highest rate in London. And Tower Hamlets had the second highest unemployment rate across London in 2014, although the rate's been um, falling since. So there's also a high rate of overcrowding <coughs> in Tower Hamlets. So all of this has an effect on the smells of the borough. Furthermore, it is debatable how good an odour is as a marker of disease. But there is something called olfactory medicine, so olfactory meaning um, smell. So medics use their sense of smell to help them diagnose illness. Moreover, sniffer dogs can be trained to detect illnesses such as cancer. So I'm going to show you the, um, the MOH reports briefly. So the image here you see on the left hand side is the survey questions, the MOH set. And so the question, the second question is, that, do you receive many complaints of offensive smells? And the next question was, have you ever been able to trace any connection between offensive smells and diseases? So the MOH talks about, in some towns, the medical officer's health report that they've been able to trace a connection between the effluvia from the sewer, sewer ventilators and disease. The table on the right shows an examination of death rates from all causes as well as links to um, the sewer ventilators. So although inconclusive in this report, the MOH highlights the correlation <coughs> between um, smells and diseases such as diphtheria in particular. So these are the snippets of smells mentioned in the MOH reports. And now I'm going to hand over to um, Michael here who's going to go through the um, technical side of things which you might find a bit more interesting. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Deborah. So there are two main components to the project. The bit that I worked on was the data mining in Python 3. And there's also the second component, which is the visualization using JavaScript and Leaflet. To share the data between the two components, we used SQLite. The reason for choosing SQLite DB is it's easy to use and quite simple. So the data mining itself was quite quick to perform. Initially, it was taking around 15 minutes on an everyday laptop. I took advantage of using multiprocessing in Python via current, um, concurrent futures, and this reduced the time to about five minutes. So how do we determine 
that a sentence in the report is smell related. So we literally split up the reports into sentences. And the way we did that was by using NLTK, um, NLTK tokenization. So once we had the sentences in the report, we were then able to identify the sentences that contain smells. We could then further categorize these smell related sentences. Um, so for example, we'd look at a sentence and if the sentence contained rubbish or um, sewer, we could then identify this as a waste related smell. We're then able to take those sentences and display them via leaflet on a map, which Deb will demonstrate shortly, um, to break down the kinds of smells um, in the different boroughs that we're seeing over London. So there's definitely more advanced ways we could analyze the, the smell related words via NLTK. NLTK is not the most user friendly tool. Now, the reason we'd want to do that is to gain more advanced contextual understanding um, of the sentences and also to reduce <coughs> false positives that we're seeing in the data set. Just wanted to mention that this is an open source project and we're happy to have more involvement in the project. So if you have interest in perhaps the visualization or NLTK, um, please speak to us after the talk. Um, we'd be more ha than happy for people to be involved. I'm now going to hand you back to Deborah to display the maps itself. <coughs> so um, this is the, um, the first map that we created. So um, during the first phase, we created this smelling map based on the number of smell hits to visualize um, the first set of results we um, we received and um, the, from the list of the existing London local authorities for the MOH report to be compiled, the geographic coordinates of present day equivalents were extracted using an API. And then for the places that did not um, exist in the API, we manually added the geographic coordinates from Wikipedia. So we couldn't, um, I spoke to a lot of um, GIS specialists and um, who do a lot of mapping and we weren't able to get um, enough help on the 19th century um, coordinates. So if you have an access to that kind of data, please let us know. We are still looking. And um, so let me just um, explain this map. Maybe we can display. Okay. So on the map, each of the points marks the number of smells occurring at the centroid of each of the locations. We grouped the number of smells into sets of 10 to avoid having giant points on the map for the places where there's, um, there are almost 100 smells recorded. And then the map scrolls through the years as well. And I'm gonna, we are going to show you the second map that we just created. It's quite small. <coughs> so... Um, this is the second map that we've created using a um, JavaScript library called the leaflet.js. And so we've got this pie chart here you can click on and the pop-up will tell you which report it is and the number of smells that are recorded within each report. And then on the right hand side you'll see more detailed information so you get um, type of smells and then also that we are linking it to the actual report. So when you click on it, it will open, it will take you to the actual report. So if you want to investigate further, you can. I think the internet's really slow. And also that we've, um, oh yeah. So when there's a no pie chart, you can still click on one of the borrows. And then if you want to look whether there were any smells reported through time, then you can use the um, time slider to go through. So maybe that borer wasn't that smelly in the past. <laughs> and then also that you can filter it. So if you are just interested in sewer, you can click on sewer. Is this sewer? Yeah. And I think the internet is quite slow, <laughs> so it's not filtering. Let's get that. Oh, so it worked. Okay. So, yeah, so that's um, Thames related um, <coughs> smell that I just filtered. 
And then what you can do is, if you're interested in um, seeing which boroughs had um, the Thames, rela Thames River related smells reported. So yeah, this, this is a map that we've just finished creating about a month ago. And then that worked actually. And then on our website, we also put um, the list of um, current London local, local authorities we've used. And um, there are lots of, so the full researchers that um, understanding historical local authorities is quite a complex um, process. So there's a really brilliant um, website called, um, I think it's called the Vision of um, Britain Through Time. <coughs> so we are hoping to get an API to, to link to this website per borough. And then we also created um, smelly pie charts using Plotly. So it was a really easy um, way of visualizing um, the smells we extracted. And um, so next is, so this is a um, list of things we are currently working on. And then one thing that we are really keen to do is extracting um, 19th century place names. And we have to rely on um, this part of the project by another project called um, Layers of London. It's led by a group of academics, and we are hoping to, to get um, a 19th century gazetteer of place names. And then what we are planning to do is that once we are able to extract the place names with the smell-related words, um, Daniela and his team from Cambridge University will make our data set available on their um, smelly maps. So this is a team of people from the Cambridge University extracted um, 21st century smells and then mapped it and I can just show you. So yeah, this is their smelly map. And if you just click on one of the streets in London, it will tell you the breakdown of smells. They extracted a street name called Longs Court. And then you can see the 43.8% um, was waste related smells. So we are also building an ontology. So they, this team has built an ontology of um, smells of 21st century, and then we are trying to adopt their ontology to build ours. But so far, because of, of the way people perceived the smells and reported smells in the 19th century, we weren't able to use their ontology. So we are building our own, and um, but based on their ontology, so that um, when we want to combine our data set with theirs, um, then we can work more easily. And so hopefully in the next year or so, the people should be able to search smells of their street from 19th century to present day. So thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, yeah. Okay. The, the data extraction, the, the words you're actually searching for. It seems to me you've got something like rubbish. Mm -hmm. um, how do you know that this is a complaint about the smell of the rubbish as opposed to rubbish blocking the carriage way? <coughs> so we used WordNet from NLTK to work out all the synonyms for the word smell. So you'd have words like smell, stench, effluvium, and then we'd go through the report um, and look for all sentences that contain those words. So therefore, we are making an assumption that that sentence refers to the smell of something. And then we would then look at the contents of that sentence and then look at if it contains key words. And then again, there's another assumption being made that if you've got the word, say, smell and sewerage in the sentence, we're making the jump that that's a smell related to, to sewerage. And also, we weren't just looking for negative smells. So we were also looking for good smells but people tend to complain about bad smells, <laughs> not really um, you know, lovely countryside smells. And also, to being in London, I think probably that was difficult. And then you need to remember this is um, <coughs> public health-related reports that medical, I mean, medical professionals compiled for the public health, public health responsibilities. So yeah, I was looking for more um, kind of medical-related um, because that affected people's health, that's why I find a lot of smell complaints. Yeah. Do you find that the vocabulary, uh, vocabulary to express smells in the 19th century is very consistent? Or do you think <coughs> in the 19th century the fluctuations of the 
So the question was that whether the, um, the words to describe smells um, in the 19th century have been consistent or um, fluctuates within the century. So within the 19th century, it doesn't really fluctuate. And I think, um, based on my research, they inherited a lot of um, the adjectives that describe smells from the 18th century. So I can see the correlation. But it was very different to how we describe smells today. So quite often they talk about offensive traits. I don't know whether you've heard of offensive traits. So it's like a tannery was a um, prime example in London. And um, so they, these reports all contain the list of offensive traits in, within each borough. But again, the, we wouldn't call that offensive traits these days, and the, we don't have tanneries in London. And then the bakeries, so bakehouses were a lot, um, it's prevalent in, in London. And um, so within the 19th century, to answer your question, um, it, it's consistent. But um, our challenge is to understand the 19th century uh, kind, of, kind of medical professionals' way of describing these smells that affected people's health. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So you talked about using like, um, I know some like Twitter data or something like that to build a more kind of up to date and not, not real time exactly, but um, like similar charts. That you have so the there. so the question was that whether we've thought about using Twitter data to extract smells. Yeah. Um, so our collaborator from Cambridge University, that's what they've done. They primarily use the Twitter feed. Um, so they extracted um, social media data to map the um, smelly maps of 21st century. <coughs> uh, what we are hoping is, as I explained <coughs> earlier, to just combine our data sets. It means that you are able to, to, um, to look at how smelly your street was um, from 1858 till you know, present day. Okay. Yeah, so that's um, our plan as well. So because I'm a medical historian, so what I'm interested in looking at um, kind of poverty and the kind of environment and how that affected people's health. So we are planning to overlay, um, to begin with, um, Charles Booth's poverty map. So um, and then we are to <coughs> trying to figure out whether there's any um, there are any correlations <coughs> between people's um, health and wealth as well. So I've done that for the 21st century. So I've got some data from maybe 2010 or 2009 from the census. So I've used the leaflet to just map. Um, it's a living, London living wage and um, death, like mortality rates at birth and um, child poverty to, to see how it looked on the map. So yeah, but we just, I, I don't have access to the 19th century census data because they haven't been digitized. So again, there are lots of challenges because because of the period we are covering. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Did you see any big changes uh, in, in the 20th century before and after 1966 when the Clean Air Act introduced? So <coughs> there obviously there were four plants now taken in the city and things like that. So, uh, Did you so see the any big sort of step changes in, in smell? So the question was after post 19, was it um, 1956, whether there have been any changes in terms of smells we extracted. So we haven't really done a lot of um, data analysis yet because we are still we were still working on mapping and getting the um, the tools ready. Um, but the the one thing that I didn't point out was that this data set um, the the reports are not complete, but as complete as it can be. And um, during war period, for instance, there are lots of missing reports. And um, maybe during the interwar period as well, that um, they published very very thin um, reports covering maybe ten years. So things like that. So we looked into normalizing the data to have a better representation as well in the future. So um, yeah, hopefully in the next few months we um, we can do some more analytical work to see any changes and patterns that we set out to to look for. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.